So this session is really designed as an introduction to Git and GitHub. And maybe you have worked with these tools, maybe you haven't, but I just want to kind of step back for a moment and think about why do we need version control in our work? Um, and so I love this example. Maybe you've seen this example before. It's a wonderful PhD comic, um, and I think it captures what many of us feel. So you write a paper, and you're like, this is it. I have finally done everything I needed to do in this paper. It has a reference list. The figures are beautiful. This is my final paper, final dot doc. And then you give it to your supervisor or your collaborator or your colleague, and they have a couple changes. So you're like, OK, that's fine still the final paper with some revisions, dot, doc. But then you give it to your colleague or your collaborator again, and the numbers have gone up a little bit. So first it was version two, now it's version six, now it's version eight with corrections. And you're kind of like, oh my gosh, when will we see the end of this paper? And then you're at revision 18, more comments, corrections nine, version 30. And then the end one is, why did I come to grad school? What? <laughs> this is the version of the paper that we are on, right? Um, and I mean, we all know this is like not the most pleasant workflow, but you may be like, what's the problem? I have version two, I have version six, I have version 30. There's just a bunch of other words in there. I, I think I pretty much know what's happening. But if you show it to your colleague and your co you ask your colleague, which is the final paper, are they gonna go first to this final dot doc? Or are they gonna go to, why did I come to grad school, right? So it's, it's hard to collaborate and to share with folks when the versions aren't clear and aren't consistent. People may not know where to start, they may not know what to grab, um, and so it makes it really difficult to, to collaborate. And this is something where people usually say back, that's fine, but this is a little project for me, why would I need version control for that? And the reason is, your number one collaborator is yourself. Just from six months ago, and they don't answer emails. Um, so actually, you're collaborating all the time. You're collaborating even on your own small projects with yourself. You're just collaborating with your past self. And so it's really, really helpful to always have version control on these things so you make sure that you know where things are. And just as another little example, this is another amazing PhD comic. People have had this problem for a long time. They were like, OK, I want versions. How do I get them? And so without version control, you end up with things where the beginning stays the same. So it's data, you know, here's the date, test, retest, re-retest, calibrate. And it's like, which version of the data do I want to use? How do I know what I want to do when I come back to this project six months later, a year later? Um, for me, it's six months, depending on your memory. Maybe it's a year. But, and you look at all these files, and you're like, what's the right data? This is not a good place to be in. It's not the most fun place to be where you're combing through your data trying to figure out what you did. And so if you have version control, it can really help to make sure that everything's synced up and you know what data went into what analysis and you know what the code looked like on a certain date and you have kind of that record for yourself and for collaborators. So I think of this framework, version control as a conversation, as really, really helpful. I think you're, it's a conversation with yourself in the future. It's a conversation with your collaborators. It's a way to make sure that uh, you're clear about what took place over the life cycle of your project. And that's just by doing little check-ins and being like, this is what the data looked like at this point. This is what I changed. This is what it looks like now, which is really, really cool and something that Git and GitHub are really amazing for. Um, the thing about a conversation, though, is it can be a little confusing at first, especially if you don't know all the terms. So there is jargon associated with Git and GitHub, and we're going to talk about all of this today. But I just want to like flag these terms. These are jargon. The first time you hear them, it's really confusing. But it just comes with taking part in the conversation, taking practice. You kind of just adopt these terms. Um, and so we'll go through them. You'll have a much better grounding after this. And then you'll have all of Neuro Academy to play around and get really familiar with what, it what it's like to talk on GitHub and to have this kind of like conversation with your colleagues. So a lot of people when they start with Git, um, I, I was guilty of this myself as well, don't totally understand and they don't necessarily care that they don't understand in the beginning. So this is a wonderful XKCD comic where he says, this is Git. It tracks collaborative work on projects through a beautiful distributed graph theory tree model. Cool. And how do we use it? 
No idea. Just memorize these shell commands and type them to sync up. If you get errors, save your work elsewhere, delete the project, and download a fresh copy. Right? So this is often what the beginning looks like. We're going to try and move past that. It totally makes sense if you're like, ah, you know, I don't know where to get commands, I don't know where to find things, how do I get started, I'm just going to memorize this list. But this is a really great environment to try and move to the next step, to feel more comfortable having these conversations online, and to really learn, like, okay, this makes sense naturally, this makes sense naturally, versus what I will definitely admit I did before I came to what was then NeuroHack Week, was I just had a sticky note, and I was like, try this command, and then try this one, and then try this one, and then if it doesn't work, call someone. You know, like, the, the point of places like this is to really get familiar and comfortable and that's what we're gonna try and get started on. The other thing I want to point out is, as you may have gathered from talking about this or maybe you've experienced it yourself, Git isn't easy in the beginning. It feels a little unintuitive and it's okay that it doesn't feel easy. It's just something that comes with practice, um, but this workshop and this environment is a great place to get started. And there are lots of experts around who will be able to help you quite a bit um, over the next two weeks. And for mistakes, there's always dangit.git.com, um, which is great, a great place because everyone makes mistakes with Git where they're like, what am I supposed to do now? And it catalogs a lot of the most common ones. Um, so it's a lot of fun to, to remember that everyone has troubles with Git. And it just takes practice to get more comfortable with it and get started. All right, I had to make this joke. So if you're ready to get started, please make sure you have a GitHub account. So I think this was in the setup instructions, but if you haven't done it already, please just go ahead and make a GitHub account. You can do that by going to github.com. You'll need a username that you can choose, email and password, um, and we're gonna use that here. So if you don't have a GitHub account, please just go ahead and make one. It only takes a few seconds, which is why I can include it here even. And then once you have a GitHub account, if you could go to this site, um, which is the same one I gave earlier, the elizabethdupree.com slash emdupree.github.io slash git course, you'll see all of the materials should look like this. So the slides that we just covered are available here in this box. Um, there are lots of other great resources. There are many more than I could list here. This is just a few that I wanted to pop out and mention. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and get started with working locally. Cool? Is anyone missing a sticky note? Okay. Can we get a few sticky notes in the back? Did we run out or did they just stop moving somewhere? Okay. I see them. They still exist. All right, cool. Yeah, and down, okay, perfect. All right, and again, if you came in a little late, the sticky notes are just for through these exercises. If you have any problems, if anything comes up where you're like, oh, I really can't do this, if you could put a sticky note on your computer, um, that way we can stop and get to you when we get a second. Okay, perfect. So if you click on the first one, tracking changes with a local repository, we're just going to work through this ourselves. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the presentation on one side, and I'm going to have my terminal on the other side. Okay, perfect. So this lesson is really designed around, may, hopefully I've convinced you that version control is important. And at least you're curious about trying it for yourself, seeing what we can do. So what we'd like to do is to get Git set up so that we can go ahead and start playing around with version control. The first thing that we need to do is tell Git who we are. So the reason for this is in, much like a conversation, it's really helpful if you know who's talking. Um, it can be really confusing to not actually have a record of who said what. And so what we want to do here is tell Git who we are. So what you can do is this git config. If you just type git config, you can see it has a bunch of options. 
What we're going to use is global because that's going to allow us to set some global properties about how Git is set up on this machine. So you only need to do this once whenever you get a new machine. And basically all we need to do is to tell Git who we are by a name, a human name, and then uh, some email, something where you can have like an address where you could get mail. Yes? If we've used Git before, should we stuff? So you can check. We'll, uh, I'll show you how to check a little bit down what it looks like. But if it's already set up, you should be able to do cat and then your local or your main home, git config, and that's this, this line here. And it should tell you, like for me, it says my name and email. It doesn't hurt to do it again, um, but it's good to just check what you have there. And we'll do that in just a minute. Okay, perfect. So for me, I'm gonna tell git that my name's Elizabeth, user.name, Elizabeth Dupree, git config global, so that it does the whole computer, user.email, cornell.edu. So one thing you'll notice is the name goes in quotes, because you have multiple strings here. The email doesn't, because it's all just one, one thing. That's really it. The other thing I want to set for you guys is what is the editor that you're going to edit in. So for me, I really love Nano. So this course is designed using Nano. If there's something else you really like, you can do that. If you want to try VI, if you already do VI, do VI. If you want to do Emacs, whatever. You can do Notepad. Um, you can do whatever makes you happy. So there are a couple other options here. But for me, what I'm going to do is git config global core.editor, and this tells GitHub what's my core editor, what's it going to ask me to do things in, and I'm going to say nano. And if you've never tried nano before, this is what it looks like. It just comes up with a little text editor. Perfect. Okay, and then I can look and see dot git config. So what this is, is I'm doing cat, which will write out the file. This tilde, which is my home direct, my home home directory, slash to be like inside that directory, and dot git config. So this means the dot in front means it's a hidden file. So if I just open it up in the file browser, I won't see it, but it's still there. And if I show that file, it'll tell me, you just told me what your editor is, and you told me who you are. And that's great. Okay, what questions do people have so far? Yeah. Yeah, so it depends on your operating system. Um, cat should be pretty common, but if it's not, there are other things you could do. You could just open it in uh, a normal text editor. So it's just a plain text file. Um, yeah. There's also an option to, if you put git config and dash tail, it gives you the options you have right now. So it would be, if you don't want to use that, but like that, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that'll list, yes, that'll list out the config file. I think as well, the, um, if you're working on Windows, the cat that you Ah, uh, yes, sorry. But if you use the git bash terminal instead of the anaconda terminal, these things will work. So the recommendation is open up the git, git bash, terminal, yes. Not your anaconda terminal. Yes. No, that's a great point. So that's, yes, sorry, that's in the setup. And also I should note, this is written here, but I should say it out loud. Um, in this tutorial, we're assuming Windows users are using Notepad because you won't have like Nano. But uh, in git bash, actually, I think you might. So that would be great. Okay, what other questions do people have? Great, awesome, okay. And as questions come up, just put a sticky note up. Okay, so now we've done some setup. We'd like to create a repository. This sounds cool. So what that really means is, let's just go to a directory where we want this repository to exist. So I'm gonna put it on desktop, so it's easier to look. And then I'll do 
PWD just to make sure that I'm actually on the desktop. So PWD is short for Present Working Directory, if you haven't seen this before. Um, and CD is short for Change Directory. It's easier to type. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a directory. So in the tradition of losing letters, it's going to be MKDIR. And I'm going to call it Papers. So now if I change directory into papers, I should see that there's nothing there. And I can, so ls is short for list. If I do ls a, which is list all, there's nothing there, just some breadcrumbs. So what I can do is type git init, and it will tell me that it's initializing an empty git repository here. So now if I do ls again, you can see there's nothing there, but if I do lsa, you can see that this .git now exists, which is pretty cool. It worked. Things are moving forward. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually look inside it really quickly just to see, get an idea about what's there. Oops, .git. Okay, so there are a lot of words. We're going to come back to some of these. And there's a lot of things that are happening under the hood. But basically, you can see there's branches, configuration, description, head, hooks, info, objects, refs, or references. So this looks good. We don't want to delete this directory. This is what's clear. So even though you can't see it, it's really important. This is where all the changes are actually going to be tracked. So when you delete this directory, you lose your local copy of the changes. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, but just know this is important. This is cool, we like this, even though we can't see it with LS. Okay, so now what we'd like to do is we have a repository, but let's go ahead and create a file. So for me, I'm gonna use nano. You can use whatever editor you like. You could use, you know, text edit. I'm gonna call it journal.md because it's a journal article. And what I'd like to do is add author names and paper title. So I'm just going to call it my, my cool paper. Me and my friends. OK? So if you're in Nano, what you're going to do is Control X to exit and then Y to save. If you're in any other editor, all you want to do is save and close the editor. All right? So then once you do that, we can type this, git status. So what this is going to do is allow us to find out about the status of files in the directory, which seems cool. So let's look. Nice. OK, so git is giving us a lot of information from this git status. It tells us we're on branch master. We'll come back to that later. It tells us we don't have any commits yet. We'll come back to that later. Um, but it also tells us we have this untracked file, which is this file we just made. So this is pretty cool. It knows right away, just because we did this git init, that this file exists now and it didn't exist before when git was initialized. So that's awesome. Um, that means we can use this to track as we make changes as we go. So the first thing we need to do is to tell git to pay attention to the file. So git notices when changes are made, but by default, it doesn't commit those changes. It doesn't write them down in its log. It just says, hey, I noticed you made a change. If you want me to care, please tell me. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep noticing for you. Um, and I think this is a misconception at first. Just because you have git there doesn't mean that it automatically records all of your changes. It records what you tell it's important. And the way you tell it is important is by adding it. So what we're going to do is we're going to do git add, and then this file we just made, journal.md, and I can't type that fast. If you haven't seen this before, tab completion is amazing. So all you do is type the beginning of the phrase and hit tab. Really useful. All right, so now we can do git status. And it's still got this little bit that we'll talk about later, but now it says new file. So we've told git this is a new file. We want you to pay attention to it. Please notice it. And when we say git status, it says, yep, I see you've made this new file. I'm going to pay attention to it. Sounds great. OK. So 
It also says it's under this thing, changes to be committed. So I really like this little kind of illustration here. Basically what this is doing is it's showing what it means when we're adding a file. So the way you can think about it is that we've now changed this, right? So we've created this file and we've added a line of code. This is this green thing. It doesn't have to be code, by the way. Git can handle anything plain text. So non-binary files are all good. You can do papers here, code, anything. Um, so you add it and it goes into the staging area and Git says, okay, these changes, you can keep adding to them before you make a commit, which is like writing it down in your notebook. You're just tracking all the things that are going to be written down, and then before you actually write it down, all of them will kind of go under the same entry, which is known as a commit. So here when we do git add, it goes to this staging area, and then with git commit, it's gonna actually get pushed to history. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, but it is important to see the difference here. So just because we did git add, now git is paying attention to it, but it hasn't noted it in its log. It's just, we've just told it, this is important, we're gonna come back to this. Let's pay attention here. Okay, what questions do people have about that? I know it's a little weird the first time you see it, if you haven't seen it before. Yes? So yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's a great question. So the question is, why is adding and committing separate? Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I would say the reason is, Commit messages are really important to write because you want to write something that cl is clear and helps you in six months or a year know what happened. And sometimes you want to add um, either a number of files or you haven't finished adding all the changes. So for example, if my commit is that I fix a bug, but the bug is in two different files and maybe I fix it over here and then I want to fix it over here, I want to add both of those changes under the same commit, which is that I fixed this bug. So sometimes it's really nice to be like, okay, I'm adding these things. They're all gonna go under the same commit, but maybe they're not the same file, or maybe I did them one after the other. I just wanted to make sure it was, it was done. Yes? You can, yeah. So what you can do is you can do um, git uh, add a, and that will add all the files that have changed. You can also add things like if I have a subdirectory here, I could add like subdirectory and it would add every file in the subdirectory. Um, so there are definitely ways to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Also sometimes just git add dot is the lazy way. It'll add everything in your directory. But it's dangerous, yeah. So it's nice if you can type the files, that's just, you make sure you know what you're, you have. But um, if you know like, okay, these are the things I wanna change, then it's really nice. Great question. Yes? Absolutely, yes. Great question. Yep, so the question was git add is not just the first time that you add a file. It's not the first time it gets added to GitHub. So if I um, committed, which we'll talk about in just a second, and then made a new edit in journal MD, which we will do, I'd have to re-add it for the new edit. Okay, great questions. All right, so the next thing um, I want us to do before we break for coffee is to commit the changes. So as you can see again, I've done git status, it now tells me it's under changes to be committed. I have this new file. So this is really great. I wanna do git commit. And what that's gonna do is pop up whatever that core editor is that you told GitHub about. So for me again, this is nano because I, I like it, but it can be whatever you happen to be working with. And it's just blank here, except it tells you, please enter the commit message for your changes. Lines starting with a pound sign will be ignored and an empty message aborts the commit. So you need to type something here. And this is really important because again, we want this as a conversation. We wanna be able to look back and see what was said. So it's really helpful to type descriptive commit messages. One thing I'll say too is that what we usually like to do is give the commit like a little title, and this is a shorter message. So here I'm gonna say add title and author, and then I can enter, and I can enter a longer commit message. So I can say like initial commit of journal.md with the title and author filled out. 
And then I can just go ahead and close Nano. So for me again, that's Control X and Y. Whatever you're doing, just save and close it. And then Git has saved that commit. So now Git's committed our file and you can see it because it says it here. So it says master root commit. It's got a couple of crazy characters that we'll talk about in a minute. Add title and author which is the name of the commit I just gave it. It says one file changed, two insertions, which was those two lines I wrote, and then it says it's created this. So this is pretty cool. So now we can look at git status, which is our best friend, because it tells us the status of GitHub. And it says on branch master, nothing to commit, working directory clean. So this is pretty cool. This means we have what Git calls a clean directory. So there are um, files which we are modifying have all been committed. And any there are, like every file that we have modified has been committed, if Git is tracking it, is probably the better way to say that. So if we've told Git that this is an important file, pay attention to it. If we've made a change and those changes have been committed to Git, then the working directory is clean. Git knows about everything that's happened there. So this is pretty cool. What we just did is we had created this repository with git init. We created a file, which we're calling journal.md. We added it, which means we told git, pay attention to this file, it's important. Um, and then we committed it. So we wrote a little message and we said, this is what's happened in this file so far. And we did git status, and we saw that we have a clean working directory, which means all the files that we told git are important or to track, all those changes have been committed, and nothing's, nothing's left that's not committed yet. So this is great. This is a really good place to be. So what if we want to look and write a little bit more? So using your favorite text editor again, if you pull up the journal.md file, so I can see what I had last time, and now it's, I'm going to write an introduction. So I'm going to say, this is the intro to my amazing paper. Maybe your introduction will be more detailed. Um, but just to kind of get an idea, this is a good first one. So I'm going to go ahead and close and save this. And now if I run git status, I can see that in, instead of uh, before where it was an untracked file, now it says it's modified a file that it knows about. So we've modified this journal file. And what we can do is git add. So again, git add is not just the first time that git finds out about a file. It's every time you make a change that you want git to notice and pay attention to. So I'm going to git add the file. I'm going to git commit. That'll pull up this little thing. And I'm going to say, wrote the introduction as my commit title. And then for my commit message, I'm going to give something a little more descriptive. I'm going to say, a first draft of the introduction to my amazing paper. I'm going to save this. And now it's got um, both of these things saved. So this is pretty cool, right? Now we've got multiple changes. We've made them on the same file. We've tracked them. We know what's happening. So now let's make a new directory, a subdirectory. And we're going to call it common, because this is going to be shared with our collaborators, let's say. And we're going to then create a file within this common directory called references. So I'm going to call it references.txt. So it's right here. And then I'm going to say author A, B, and author C, D, 2019. Very important reference. Everyone should read it. Um, hmm? <laughs> yes, exactly. Now put it in your reference manager. Um, okay, cool. So now this is great. We have this reference in this file. Let's go add it to journal. Now I'm going to cite 
A, B, or let's just call him B and D, 2019. So we're citing them for our whole paper. This paper is looking really good so far, guys. Okay, so I've made yet another change to journal. And I can see that if I do get status, I can see that journal has been modified again. And now it tells me that common is untracked. So let's go ahead and add common. And let's do get status again. Okay, great. So now it knows that common has this file uh, references, but we haven't actually added journal. So what we'd like to do is also add journal. So it's going to tell you um, that we could add it using this commit A shortcut. For now, I want to sh write it out for you, but this is available later when you want to do it. So we're going to do git add journal. If we do git status again, now we can see that both the files are here. And we're going to do git commit just like before. So we've added them. We're going to write a little commit message. Um, adds in initial references. Adds in reference for 2019 paper from B and D. And that's really it in terms of the very basics of what we want to do, which is create repositories, have Git track our files, and be able to make changes, and have Git know that that happened. This is really cool, but there's a lot you can do once you have this done. So once Git has this kind of information, we can start doing a lot of other really cool things. What questions do people have before we move on? OK. And again, if a problem comes up, just put up a sticky note. OK, so the first thing we might want to do is to be able to actually look at the history that we've created. So we want to look and see what are the changes that we've made? What have we done so far? What are some of the differences in the file? Because this can be really, really useful to be like, OK, what happened? What have I done? So the first thing is um, let's say that we just want to look at the difference from a commit. So let's say that we want to add another paper. So let's do, we're going to go, we're going to open journal.md again, and we're going to add another reference. I'm going to say we should also reference Smith 2011, which might be a real, it's very likely a real paper. Um, OK. Once we've done that, we can now do, instead of where we did git status before and we saw that it was modified, if we want to see what that modification was, we can do git diff, which is this one, journal.md. And now it's showing in green the line that I added. So you can actually see the difference here. So let me move it a little further up. So this is what I had written before. And now it's showing me in green, this is the new line. If a line was deleted, it would show it in red. And if you don't have colors, you should at least see a little plus in front of lines that are added and a little minus in front of lines that are deleted. So this is pretty cool. We can actually see what happened. And again, if you uh, aren't on this page, just go back to Introduction to Git and GitHub and click on the lesson looking at history and differences, just so you can follow along here. So cool, this is awesome. So let's, let's go ahead and add that to this very important reference. Git commit adds in missing reference, adds in reference for Smith 2011 to introduction. So again, I have a commit title, a longer descriptive message about the commit. And now, if I do git log, so this is a new command. Before we did, um, we were just adding commits and then we could look at differences for individual files. If we do git log, we can see everything we've done so far. So this is actually going to show us you know, every commit we've made and the descriptions for them. So this can be really useful if you want to see when you made a change or where you made a change. You can actually go and look at what we call the history, which is just the git log. 
So that's really cool. It gives you a ton of information, which is really useful. So you get this crazy long string. Um, this is called a commit identifier. Um, you don't need to worry about how they're generated, but the point here is that it's unique to your commit. So it gives a way to trace back and say, OK, I made this individual commit, much like the ORCID that we referenced earlier, where it's unique to you. This is unique to that commit. So that can be really useful to go through and find things. It also gives you who authored it. So this is really, really useful once you start working with many people. Again, and this is why we had to put in what our name was and what our email was, so that when you have a lot going on, you can be like, oh, look, this person authored it. If I have a change or a question, they're the person I should contact. It also tells you the date, and then again, your commit title and actual message. So that's really cool. Um, the other thing you can do with git diff, so we looked at it for a file that we had made a change on. We can also look at it for an actual commit. So if I go and I git diff this commit, it'll do the difference between my current version and this version. So here I'm doing wrote the introduction, and it'll tell me that you know, the difference is that I didn't have this before. And now in that commit, I added this is the intro. And then I also have since added we should also reference this. So you can see what the differences actually were, which is really, really useful. OK. And then one way that you can actually go back in time, um, and there's a lot more here that we won't have time to cover, but you can actually check out a previous commit. So if we go and check out this one that I just did, so for me it was wrote the introduction. It'll tell me that I'm now back at that commit. I do ls, I can see just the file and the whole common directory is gone. So don't worry, it's still there. Git still knows it exists, but because we're kind of going back in time, we can go to a time before common existed. So this can be really useful if you made a bug or you, know, you want to go see what something looked like before, you can do git checkout. And again, there are a lot of other ways to work with history. We won't have time to go into all of them, but just to kind of point, this is something you can do. All right, so let's say we've looked at this. We said, all right, I can see what I used to have written, but now I really want to go back to my current draft and I want to keep working on it. So then all you do is git checkout master, which you might remember is the branch name. So every time we've made a commit so far, it said on branch master. And that'll just push us right back up to the most recent version of history so we can see exactly what's happening. So that's really cool because it means that we can use these commits not only to read and understand what happened or to communicate it to other people, but to actually look at the older version of those files. We can pull them up again, look at them, and then we can also get back to the files that are the most recent version and that we want to work on. What questions do people have about that? Yes? So can you do um, the same things, for example, if you work in, uh, in Word or something, and you add some text and you add some comments and you work for an hour on, uh, on the introduction, for example, and then you try to do the same? Will, will this work as well, or do you need to do it in the text editor? So you mean in Microsoft Word? Yeah, so that's a great, so the question is, could we do the same thing in a text editor like Microsoft Word, where we make changes and then we want to go back? So I think the problem with Microsoft Word for this is that Microsoft Word is going to give you that .docx, which is a binary file, so you can't open it kind of anywhere. You have to open it inside Microsoft Word. So it makes it really, really difficult to track with Git and GitHub. Git and GitHub works really, really well if you have plain text. So if you're writing your paper in like R Markdown or regular Markdown or um, just plain text or LaTeX or anything like that, then GitHub is perfect. But if you're going to write your paper in, R in uh, Microsoft Word, it's a little bit harder. Has been changed. Yeah. Right. So it, yeah. So that's kind of the difference. And I think what's really really useful is knowing what the changes are if you're collaborating. But sometimes you may not be able to. I think PDF files are similar as well. So yeah. PDF files 
you can know that the file has changed, but you can't know what has changed. In it. Exactly. Yep. And that's just because, again, this is like a binary. There's no like individual text for Git GitHub. Great question, though. What other questions do people have? OK. Yes? Can you check out the specific file instead of the whole? Previous commit? Yeah, yeah. So if you check out a commit, you get the whole directory at that time. So then you can look at specific files. Do you mean that you'd want, so sorry, the question was, could I check out a specific file instead of a specific commit? So do you mean that you want to, uh, like what would, what would be the motivating use case? So for example, if I want to just go back to this version of this specific file without so anything else changing on anything else? Yeah. Um, so you, can, sorry, Kiersey, yeah. You can. It is, yes, you absolutely can. Um, the one thing I'll note is the way we're doing it here is that you, you aren't actually able to then, so there are better ways to amend history than what I'm showing you right now. What I'm showing you right now is really just how to see what something looked like at a previous point. Um, but if you wanted to go and then make changes, keep those changes from the past and move forward, there's a slightly different way that you would need to do it. But yes, yes, you can. I, we just probably won't have time to talk about it right now. But that's what office hours are for. <laughs> Perfect. OK. What other questions? Awesome. OK. So I want to really quickly talk about branching because we keep seeing this term master. And this is actually like something that's going to be really, really useful when you start collaborating with people here at the hackathon is working on different branches. So let's talk about what that means for a second. Um, so basically what we've been doing is we've been working on what's called the master branch. And that's just Git jargon. Um, but the master branch in Git world means the uh, the default branch, the main branch, the thing that you start on. And so when we did git checkout master, it was taking us to the master branch, the most recent version. Branches are really useful though because maybe if you're collaborating with yourself, maybe you're like, what if I change these values? How's it gonna affect everything? And I just wanna play around and see. So it's really useful to make a branch with something called like changed values. And then you can explore how that goes and maybe it goes really well and you wanna use it or maybe it goes terribly and you wanna go back to your first version. Branches are really useful to kind of thread out these different ideas. They're also really useful when you wanna collaborate on a big project and let's say your teammate's making changes and you're making changes and they're on slightly different topics. So, you know, you're adding in a new feature and your teammate's fixing a bug. And so it's really nice if you guys have separate branches because then you're not stepping on one another's toes as you go. You have your own place to work in and then when you want to pull in changes from your colleague, you can, but you're not worrying about constantly pulling in their changes. So it doesn't start, it doesn't actually create a new directory. The way that I would let, I usually think about it is that it literally like branches off from the main one. So it creates almost a, a copy that you can keep working on while you still have your original copy. Does that make sense? Sorry, the question was, is a branch equivalent to a directory in Git? But let's play with it. Let's see how it looks. All right, so what we can do is we can actually just make a new branch. So if we say git checkout, which is that command we used before to check out a commit and to check out master, now we're gonna use a B, which means create a branch. B is for branch. We're gonna call it paper with John, who's our one of our friend authors. And now it'll tell us that we switch to a new branch, paper with John. So if we do git branch, which is the way we can list branches, you can see it now has a little asterisk next to paper with John because that's the branch we're on now. So if we do nano again, or your, tech, your favorite text editor, back on journal, and we're gonna 
modify the title. So instead of a cool paper, it's going to be an awesome paper. And me, John, and my friends. So we're going to make these changes. We're going to save it. And then we're going to go ahead and add those changes again. We're going to git commit them. And we're going to say modify title and add John. Updates to awesome paper and adds John as co-author. So we'll save this. And now this was all in our branch with John. So if we do git checkout master and we look at journal, we can see, sorry, let me do a cat so it shows up at the top. So we're on master and we did look at journal and now it's back to me and my cool paper and John is not a co-author. So we have those changes that we made on our branch but we also have the copy before we made those changes. So this is really nice because it allows you to have two different copies and Git knows about both of them. Yes? They're not really copies. Right, yes. Yeah. You have the state of master, then mm -hmm. you're actually having like one more little commit, or, and that's, that little commit is called now John, new John. Yep. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, it's, it's, it's hard to think in the full model, it gets a little more complicated, and so we don't have time to do the full model, but yes, if you wanna like really think about how Git is doing the internals, I'd love to talk about that afterwards. Um, it is just important to know that you can have these two, yes, you can go back and forth between the two, absolutely. What other questions do people have? Yeah. That's not in this new branch, is it? So if I do git checkout paper with John, let's see. So now I've switched to the branch paper with John. And if I do ls, I still have common. So the reason is because it not made a copy, but basically made a, a version at that moment, at the present, that we could then make changes to. So because common was already tracked, because we told GitHub, this file is important, please pay attention to it, it was still kept when we made this other paper with John copy. Okay, so when you create a new branch by default, it copies everything that's already in Yes, exactly, yeah. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so this git branch command. So here it'll show me that I have master, which was the branch I started with, and then because I just did this git checkout, it shows me that I have a little star next to paper with John, because that's the branch I'm on now. Great question though. Yes, and so this is all here, but it's, it's, it's one of those things you just practice and it comes easier. Okay, so I'm gonna check out master again. Okay, great. So let's keep going, because I know we're gonna run low on time. All right, so this is really cool. So we're able to work with ourselves just in terms of we can create files, we can commit files, we have a history that we can look at and see everything we did. This is really cool. So what if now, instead of just working on this one machine, because everything I've done so far is just stored just on my laptop, what if I also wanted to have a copy somewhere else? So this is where something like GitHub is really, really useful because it, it's for distributed version control. And all that means here is that basically we're having distributed copies. So it's not centralized to my laptop. It can be in many different places. And GitHub is really useful because that's one of the places it can be. Um, and it's sort of a community standard place to draw from. So it allows you to do a lot of really amazing things besides just commit your code. Um, and we won't have time to talk about all of them, but a few I wanted to talk about are that 
it allows you to actually, so you can look at the code there. It has really nice syntax highlighting. It also uh, lets you release your software. So if you create versions, kind of the thing we were talking or mentioned earlier about fair data, it's really great for that. So you can version your software and have DUIs that are created for it which is really cool. You can have issue and bug tracking. So GitHub is actually a really good place for conversations around projects, um, often through their issues. And you also have project management tools. Um, so you have kind of a project board where you can carry your issues over. And it makes it much, much easier if you're working on, say, a hackathon project with your friends to know kind of what are the different pieces that need to get done, how can I do them, and where are they in the status. So GitHub is really, really cool. All right, so I assume you all have a GitHub account. If you don't have a GitHub account, please make a GitHub account. Um, it only takes a few seconds. So you will need to know what your username and password is for that account. So if you've made it previously, please just double check that you know that. Um, so what we want to do first is we want to log into GitHub. So for me, I'm logged in. If you've logged in recently, maybe it looks something like this. Um, and I can click this little button. Oh, I am so zoomed out. OK. I can click this little plus button, and I can do new repository. And I'm going to call it papers, because that's the name locally for me. I'm going to describe it as a repository for my cool paper. And because I'm already importing a repository that exists, I'm not going to initialize it with a readme. Otherwise, definitely do that. Um, readmes are super, super valuable just to kind of be a welcoming uh, page for your project and let people know what's happening. Also, same thing with git ignore and license. So license tells people under what terms you're making this available which is really, really useful for all the reasons Marianne talked about earlier. And then uh, a git ignore is a way to get git to ignore certain kinds of files. Um, but again, we're importing something, so we're going to skip this step. So let's just go ahead and create the repository. Boom. Looks amazing. OK. Ah, it's so small. So git, GitHub is saying this is great. Here's the different ways you can get information into this repository. So let's go back to our guide. And it says very similar information. So reading GitHub is super, super useful, actually. I find this is always the thing that is really confusing in the beginning, is you get so much text from Git, it's hard to know where to look. But it's trying really hard to help you. Um, so it is super overwhelming at first to be like, what is this thing? Why is it telling me so much? But all the information is actually really, really good. And GitHub's the same. So what we're going to do is we're going to push an existing repository from the command line. Ta -da. All right. So first thing we need to do is we're going to do this git remote add origin Da, 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 da. So what this da, 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 da is, is it's the actual web address of the repository we just created. So for me, it's github.com slash emdupree slash papers, because that's what I named my repository. For you, it'll be github.com slash your GitHub username slash whatever you name the repository, maybe papers. Um, and then the other little bit is that we're adding what's called a remote. We'll come back to that in a minute. So remote, add origin. So this is a little just bit of GitHub jargon. Basically, in GitHub land, origin means kind of the central copy. Um, so you can have the other one that's really common is called upstream. So for example, if you're working with a project that's already online, you might have a remote called upstream, which is the original copy. So I love nylearn. So let's say it's nylearn slash nylearn is my upstream. And then my origin would be my copy of nylearn. So it would be emdupree slash nylearn. And that way you can communicate with both of those. I don't totally know why origin and upstream were chosen as the words that everyone loves, but they were. And so it's just a convention that you need to be aware of. So if we go ahead and we type this command, now what we should be able to do is to do git push u, so that's setting it up for the first time, 
origin master. So what this is saying is there's a lot happening here. So let's walk through it. Um, so basically what we're trying to do is we're using git to push. So we're giving the changes to somewhere else, which in this case is our origin which in this case is our GitHub. It could be another computer you have. It could be anywhere. The goal here is that we're pushing the changes somewhere, and we're doing this for this master branch. So that's the main branch where we have my cool paper, not papers with John. So it'll tell me it's thinking about it, and then it'll say you have a new branch on GitHub called master. So now if I go, and for me, um, I'm logged in already. You may get asked, please enter your GitHub username and your GitHub password. And just do that. So GitHub will believe you are who you say you are. What's really cool is, if that worked for you, if I go to GitHub and I refresh MDP papers, now I can see exactly what I have locally. And I can click on commits and just like before where I did git log, now it's giving me a log of all these commits on GitHub, which is super cool. Now we have a copy that's not just on our computer of our paper and everything that we've done with it. Okay, so that's really amazing. The, what questions do people have about that first actually? Because that was a big thing that we just did. Yes? Okay, yes, so, yeah, 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 thank you, Kirsty. that would be awesome. Yes? Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you define the origins? How do you define origin? Yeah, so, Great question. So this command here, git remote add origin, and then a, a name, what that's really doing is it's saying we're going to add origin as a remote. And so the origin name is the last argument. So what, if you change this to anything else, origin would be different. One way you can look at that is to do git remote, I like to do v for verbose, and it'll tell you you have an origin and it has this name or this address. And what's the dash u part? Yeah, the dash u, so that's, that's uh, because we're doing this for the first time. We're setting it up for the first time. Yes. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Did you initialize without a readme? On GitHub, is there anything in that repository already? Okay, yes, yeah. So this was the, the bit about if you have a readme, then we'll have to pull. So we'll get to that in a second, but the, yes, yes, that's why. It's because there's a readme there already. What other questions do folks have? Yes. So is it just the master branch? Is all we've pushed, yes. Absolutely, so that's perfect, yes. And that, the question was, should there be the other branch yet? No, not yet. Um, yes? So now if we make edits in our folder, it will automatically happen on GitHub as well? So we'll have to push it again. So the question was, when we make edits in our folder, will it automatically show up on GitHub? So we'll have to do the git add, commit, and push again. But yes, no, we'll, we'll walk through that again. What other questions do people have? Yeah. It's a very simple thing. It's just a place somewhere else. Like it's, a, it's a web address. And, and that thing is a, is a, is a Git repo on the web address. Yep. So you could have like a, you know, plenty of remotes. I can have like a, maybe a machine on with SSH. I can you know, push to like have a remote yep. over there. I can maybe have even a local remote somewhere on my own machine. Yep. It's just another place. And exactly. That's, that's, uh, and you give it a name. So yep. That name here is origin, but you just replace on the web or somewhere yep. and, and the name. That's, 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 that's all it is. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, so I think that's definitely worth emphasizing. Like, origin, we're giving it that name because that's the convention and that's what you'll see, but you can give other names, you can do other things. It's just, this is what you'll see most often, so this is really the best place to start. Yes? Yeah, so yes, so if you, sorry, the question was, if you don't have internet when you're working with Git, how do you get the changes online? Yes, so you'd wanna just push again when you, when you get internet. Or GitHub, sorry. Git will always have the changes without internet. GitHub, to push it, yes, you'll need internet. Okay. Just emphasizing that, you know, there's only two commands are interacting with, with, with GitHub. If you have like your remote on GitHub, there's push and pull. Yep. Those two, if you don't do push and pull, you don't, you're not interacting with the, with your, with the web. Or, you know, you're, you're giving everything over. Okay. Cool. All right. So in the interest of time, I'm going to move ahead a little bit. Um, just for the folks who haven't been able to get anything on the web yet, so if you do git pull, so after you add the remote, what you'll need to do is still git remote add. If you do git pull, in my case it says already up to date, for you it should pull the file. And so we'll talk about this a little bit later, but just to give a, a preview, basically what git push is doing is you're pushing your changes to another remote. You're saying, please take my changes. What git pull is doing is saying, I would like to pull in the changes that you have made into my copy. And so this is really useful if, for example, you know, there's a file on GitHub that's not on your computer, um, then you'd want to pull that down to your copy. So if you do git pull, you should see some changes, and then you can do git push u origin master, and it should work. But if it doesn't, please let me know. Because the next thing I want to show is that once, if this has worked for you, so if you have successfully pushed, and you go to GitHub and you see everything that you've done so far, we're feeling good about it. What we'd like to do is to actually delete your local copy. Dun, 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 dun. So for me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go on my desktop. I see this papers and I'm going to move it to trash. Actually, first I'm going to copy up one directory, and then I'm going to move it to trash. Okay, so now I don't have a copy of papers on my local machine. What? So what we want to do is we're going to do git clone. So this is again git jargon. Clone here just means clone as in copy. So make a copy of whatever this is from GitHub, in this case, on my local machine. So what I can do is I can do git clone, and then I'm gonna do the exact same address from earlier that I had as my origin. So in my case, it's my username, EMD pre, and then papers.git. For you, update, so it's your username and whatever you name the repository. And then it'll say cloning into papers, unpacking objects, now I can look and I have my papers directory again. And if I go back into papers, I have everything that I had before, which is great. The other thing I want to show really quickly is that if you do git log from within papers, I still have all the history that I had before. So even though this is a new copy, I have an exact record of everything that I had done. What questions do people have? Yes? Could you have used yeah, this is a great question. So could I have used git pull instead of git clone? So the problem there would be that I didn't have a copy of the repository already. So because I had deleted it, I had moved it to trash. If I did git pull, git wouldn't know what to pull. There's no that hidden dot git directory that tells it where everything is. So I have to do a git clone to make a copy. And then once I'm in that copy and I have all my history, then I can start pulling again. No, it's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> so, do you mean inside a Git directory? So, um, and so the Git clone command there. Yeah. 
Yeah, so what you'd be asking Git to do is to pull in changes from a web address. But if you don't have that, you don't have that directory, so you don't have kind of the, the list of what's happening, so it doesn't know what to pull in. You really need to make a copy of it first with clone, so then it has the whole log and everything and it can start pulling in changes. Yeah, no, it's a great question. What other questions do people have? Git clone is super useful. If you're working on a code base that's online, if you're doing open source work, Git clone all the time. It's really great. It allows you to get stuff down, and then you can start working with it and doing push and pull to your branch. OK. We now lost the second branch. Yes, we did. We did, but that's OK. We're going to get it back. Well, we're going to work with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. So the last thing I want to do, I showed you this a little bit already, but what I want to do is to actually push changes to GitHub. So we pushed the whole repository. Now we want to make a change, and we're going to um, go ahead and push it again just to get a little bit of practice. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do, we're going to open journal.md, and now we're going to write a results section. These results were amazing. It's very detailed, very helpful. I think we've, we've solved it. Um, okay, so that's my results section. It would not pass peer review, but it's there. And we're going to go ahead and again, we're going to add it because if we do git status, git will tell us that we've modified this file, but we haven't ad added it yet. So we'll do git add. If we do git status again, you'll see, oops, git status again. You'll see now it says modified, but we've added it. So for me, it's in green. And then we can do git commit. We can write a commit title added in results section. Described my amazing results. All right. And now that we've done, so again, all we really did here was we edited the file, we git added it, we git committed it, and now we're going to git push it. So because we've already set up this remote, we don't need to do it every time. Now we can just do git push. And it'll tell me that it's pushing to the remote, which again is origin, because we defined it. We defined a remote origin, and we gave it a web address. We're pushing it there. And now if I go back to GitHub, I should see now I have five commits instead of four. And if I look at this, I have my result section. Okay, what questions do people have about that? Awesome, okay. All right, so now what I really wanna talk about just really quickly is that basically what we can do once we've got things on GitHub is we can collaborate with other people or with ourselves. So. Let's see how quickly I can do this, because I know we're running low on time. Ah, OK. OK, so let's go ahead and clone our repository again, but let's put it in a different directory. So if I'm back on desktop, so this is for me right, where, right above where papers lives, and I git clone, same address, github.com slash my username slash papers dot git. And now I say that I want to call it something. So I'm going to call it laptop papers. So now if I ls, I can see that I have both papers, this one, and laptop papers. So I have two copies. So if I go into papers, so not the one I just cloned, the original one, just for the sake of being in the same one. Let's do, we'll go edit our same journal article. It's really filling out, guys. So now we have an intro, we have results, we're gonna add some figures, things are looking up. All right, so I'm gonna add figures here, and I'm gonna say 
lots of beautiful figures were generated. Okay, so I'm gonna save this. I'm gonna do exactly the same workflow I did before. So git add journal, git commit, add figures. Describe my wonderful figures, which you'll learn how to make later this week in a few other courses. Okay, so now I've committed it and I'd like to git push it. So now if I go and look at my GitHub repository as soon as it pushes, I should see that it's incremented one commit. That's pretty cool. Now, let's go make, look in that copy I made. So I was in papers and I made this copy called Laptop Papers. And again, if you're lost, just put up a yellow sticky note. So, okay, so I'm in Laptop Papers and I would like to git fetch. So this is related to git pull. The difference here is that you'll see, we'll walk through this in a little bit more detail, but basically git pull is secretly two commands, one of which is git fetch. So here I wanna disentangle them a little bit and I'm just gonna do git fetch. And it tells me that it's grabbed these things. And so now it hasn't it hasn't made the changes, it's just grabbed them from the internet. So I can do git diff again. If you remember, we did git diff on a commit before. Now because we fetched, we can do git diff on what it says it wrote them to, which is origin slash master. And we can see the difference is this line, lots of beautiful figures were generated. So our version on GitHub has that line, but the version in this local copy doesn't have that line. So I really like that line. I want to keep it. What I can do then is do git merge origin master. And again, origin master is just because that's the name that it tells you it has. Where is it? Right here. So when we did git fetch, it said it wrote it to origin master. So if I do git merge, now it'll tell me that it fast forwarded, which means it could just pull those changes in. There weren't any conflicts. I don't think we'll have time to get to conflicts, but it's always something we can talk about later. Um, and so we'll git merge those in. Now we can see that they're here. And if we do cat in my case, or whatever your editor is, and you look at JournalMD, you can see lots of beautiful figures were generated. So this is really cool. So we had a copy of the local repository called Papers. We made a change. We pushed it to GitHub. Then we went into our other local copy, which could be on a different machine. In my case, it's on the same machine. Probably in your case, it's on the same machine. But it could be on a cluster. It could be on your home versus work computer. And you can actually pull those changes in. And now all of these are synced. So that's really, really nice. Um, so amazing, okay, so and the reason um, we did it as fetch versus merge was just so we could really look and see what those differences are. If you know what the differences are and you just want to pull them down, all you need to do is git pull. So git pull is actually a fetch and a merge. So that's really, really nice when you're like, okay, I've talked with my collaborators, I've looked at it on GitHub, I know what it is, I just wanna pull it down so I can work with it myself. Then you just do git pull right in your git directory after you've set up the remote and it would just pull it down from the remote. What questions do people have about this idea? Okay. Questions always come up and that's totally fine. All right, so I have some stuff here about merge conflicts. We're not gonna have time to do that right now because I really, really wanna get to pull requests, um, but I do wanna flag that this is here and I'm happy to talk about it later. Okay, and there's an exercise if you're interested in having multiple branches in a remote repository. Basically, all the difference is, is instead of doing when we did git push origin master, now you're gonna do git push origin my branch, whatever your branch is. But there's a little exercise to walk that through because it's useful. Okay, 
The last thing I really want to touch on is pull requests because I feel like they're super important in a hackathon, especially. Um, this is something that you end up using a lot when you're collaborating with other folks, so it's really good to know how to do one. Basically, the problem is this. So, so far, we've been collaborating with just ourselves. We had our repository locally. We have our repository on GitHub. So we could, one solution, if we wanted to bring other co-authors in, is we could add them as collaborators on GitHub. So basically what you do is you go here, you go to settings, and then you click on collaborators. It would ask you for your password because it wants to be secure. And then you can go ahead and search in your collaborators' names. And then when you add them, they'll have just as much permission to the repository as you do. So they can also write files um, and make changes on the repository. So this is one solution. But maybe what you want to do is you want to have a lot of people be able to collaborate. Maybe you don't know in advance who's going to be interested in collaborating. Or maybe you want to make it so that when people request changes, you can still review them before you merge them in. So what do you do then? So the solution um, is pull requests. So that's another little bit of jargon. But basically what it means is, is sort of intuitive if you think about git pull. So you're requesting that someone git pull your changes into their code. So it's requesting a pull or a pull request. So basically, what we'd like to do is to make it so that we can work with someone else's code. So the process there is that we have to find someone else's code. So maybe this is your collaborators. In our case right now, it'll be mine. Um, but it's whatever code is out there in the world that you want to work with, but you don't necessarily have right access to already. So the first thing you want to do is find this repository. So for me, I'm going to go to this Git course, which is what we're teaching right now. Um, so for me, again, this is github.com slash emdupree, my username, slash git course with a hyphen. And the first thing I want to do is to fork it. So if I look at the GitHub interface, so you can see the title here, you can see a bunch of little tabs, including that settings one we were just in about adding collaborators. You can watch and star, which are ways to monitor and interact with repositories, and then you can actually fork it. And what this is going to do, fork, I really don't know who chose that term. It's very confusing. But basically, the goal here is like a fork in the road. You make a copy of that repository for your own account on GitHub. So what we're going to do is we're going to fork it, and it's going to ask all right, I have way too many repositories um, or organizations, but you're going to say, I want to fork it to my account. So I'm going to fork it to this uh, account I also have called CU OpenSci. And then it'll have this little lovely animation where it's forking the repository. So it's making a copy of it that you can work with. So now, in your case, this will probably be your username slash git course. And then what we can do is we have write permissions to this copy or this fork. So we can make changes here, and then we can request that they get pulled in elsewhere. So let's do exactly that. So we've now forked it. So we now have this copy. So let's do git clone again. Just like we did git clone before for our own repository, um, where we had papers, now we can git clone this copy that we've made. So I'm going to go back onto desktop because I like working there. Um, but wherever you want to work, just do git clone and then the, you, the address that you just created by forking. So in this case for me, it'll be github.com slash cu open sci because that's where I forked it to. For you, it'll probably be your username slash git course. Oh, sorry. And so this is good. It's yelling at me that I already have a folder called git course on my desktop. Um, so I'm going to fork it somewhere else. OK, so I'm going to git clone, see open side, git course onto my local machine. And it should succeed. If it didn't succeed, please put up a yellow sticky note. So for you, again, though, you don't want to get clone this address. You don't want to get clone CU open site. You want to get clone your fork. So it'll be github.com slash your username slash git course. 
And the important thing there is that you have write permissions to your fork. You wouldn't have write permissions to see you open Sci. Yes? Okay, so on GitHub, the concern is unable to fork the repository. Does it say something? Yeah, it cannot fork because you own this repository and are not a member of any organization. Because you own the repository? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so the concern here, this is a really good question. So the concern is I am trying to fork something on GitHub, um, and it's telling me that I can't fork it because I already own it. So this is just because the goal of forking is to make a copy of the code that you don't have access to so you can create pull requests. If you have already have access to it, there's no point in forking it because then you just make the changes, right? So what we'd like to do is to make a fork or a copy of code that you don't have access to. So it's just easy if you use this git course, so at emdupree slash git course, um, this one, but you could fork anything else. Okay, great. What other questions do people have? Yes? So I forked the uh, repository on my, say, on the desktop now. Yeah. And then I'm going to move the folder to a different place on my left. Is that going to? Yeah, great question. So the question is if I've forked it and then Git cloned it, or just Git cloned it generally, yeah. and I move that folder on my desktop, is it still going to work? Yes. So what Git is working off of is that little .git directory, the hidden one. So wherever the folder is, so long as that .git directory stays intact, it'll be fine. The one thing I'll note is it gets a little weird if you create Git directories inside of Git directories. So if you can just make sure that wherever you're creating the Git directory isn't already a Git directory, it makes life much easier. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna keep going so we can finish at a reasonable time. Okay, so now I have this copy, see you open side, that I have forked on GitHub. And I've cloned it locally. So here it tells me I have Git course, which is from the see you open side. Amazing. Okay, so what I would like to do is I wanna make a pull request. So this is actually just the same as what we were doing before. We can add changes, we can commit them, make changes, git add them, git commit them, git push them, and now, so I showed you this git remote command earlier, oh, sorry, I have to go into git course. I showed you this git remote command earlier, now it knows that origin is where I cloned it from. So it's saying, I know that you got this from GitHub, I have a record of that, great. So when you push, it'll go live there, which is because I forked it somewhere I have right access to. So it makes it much easier to work with other people because now I can show what changes I want to make. Okay, so let's say that now what I would like to do is, oops, where am I? Oh yeah, I'm in the whole thing. Um, okay, so what I would like to do is under setup, I want to add something else. So it says file, installation, software, and let's say I'd like to add, please make a GitHub account. So I'm gonna save this. I've made a change. I'm gonna do git status. I can see that setup was changed. I'm gonna do git add, just like I did before, setup, git commit m, Oh, sorry, nope, let's not do that. Git commit, so I'm gonna write a title for the commit. So I'm gonna say um, added GitHub account requirement. And then my message will be in setup, reminded that we need a GitHub account. I'm gonna save my commit message. Okay, cool. So now if I go ahead and I want to push these changes, all I need to do is git push. And it will push them, not to the original copy, but to my fork, where I'm allowed to push changes. So now if I go to CU Open Science, so before I had 613 commits, now I have 614 commits, and one of the commits is added this GitHub account requirement. 
So, super cool, right? So now I have this and it's on my copy. So what if I wanted to make a pull request? So GitHub is trying to be really, really helpful in that it says, hey, look, I've noticed that you're one commit ahead of where you copied this from. So you copied this from, or forked this, from Ian Dupree on her, my GitHub pages branch. You can see that just here. What would you like to do? Would you like to create a pull request? And I'm gonna say, that sounds like a great idea. I really think they should make the changes that I've done. So I'll click on pull request and it'll spin for a second. And then it'll say, hey, okay, you can create a pull request. Before you do, just so you know, let's look and see at the changes you made. And so GitHub will show me you've added these lines and this is what you've written. Do you want to create this pull request? And I'll say, yes, sounds great, I love it. And if I hated them, I'd probably go back, make more changes locally, do it again. So let's say I love it, yeah. It's just those two lines on the top, like, uh, you know, base repository, and then little arrow, and then add repository. I think that's, that's where people sometimes get confused. Yeah, so... Show that first to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the question is about what or the, the comment is about what these are. So basically what this is doing is because I was at my fork and I clicked, GitHub was very helpfully like, you've made a change, would you like to do a pull request? And I said yes, GitHub assumed that what I would like is this original place, the thing I forked, I would like to make a change to that, which is why this arrow is pointing here, and I want the change to come from this fork copy, so this see you open sci git course. And here, these are just the branches. So everything we talked about branches, in this case, I'm instead of master doing GitHub pages as my main, you can pretend it's master, um, but it is nice to know you can change them. And then it's saying, I wanna pull these changes into here. I'm going to request that in this case, EM Dupree or whoever it is you're pull requesting from pulls their changes in. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question is, what's the difference between working on your own branch of a folder versus working on branches from a fork? Is that right? Yeah, a great question. So um, basically, the difference is that if I want to work with someone else's code. If I copy their code down, so if I do a git clone, let's say I like Nylern as an example, so I don't have write access to Nylern. If I do a git clone of Nylern, which is just a Python library, and now I have it on my desktop, I could make a branch there and I could make changes, but I still can't push those changes back because I don't have write access. So I have to make a fork, so I'd make em Dupree slash Nylern, and then I could do a branch there, I could push changes to that copy, and then I could pull request into Nylern, and I could say, hi Nylern people, I love your library, I've made these changes, would you please consider pulling them into your code base? Okay, what other questions do people have? Yes? Can you only ask to pull some changes and some commits, or it just does everything or nothing? Yeah, so the question is, can you only ask to pull some changes or some commits, or does it do everything or nothing? So this is a great question. So this is when branches can be really, really useful. Because you can, so usually you'll fork it and it will have the history up to that point. You can make your changes in a branch. So the branch should be just the changes that you want to be pushed onto or pulled into their repository. And then that branch, when, it, when you make the pull request and the, if they accept it, then those changes will be pulled into the main code base. So ideally, when you're making lots and lots of changes, um, you wouldn't want to pull all of those in, which is why it's nice to just use branches to pull out the parts that you want and just work with those. I said pull a lot. Does that make sense though? Yes. Okay. No, it's one of those things, if you just practice it a little bit and sometimes draw it out, I think I saw whiteboards in there, it helps a lot just to kind of imagine the whole workflow. Okay, but we haven't even done a pull request yet. So if we click this button, it'll say create pull request. And 
it'll say, um, so for me, it happens to have an issue template. For you, it probably won't. Um, but two things that I want to flag, just because we're very short on time and these are really important, is that when you make an issue, it's really, really helpful if you can, just like we did with the commits, have some descriptive text that really explains what you're trying to change. Also, when you're running code projects, so here at the hackathon for your own project, you may want to make what's called an issue template. And you can do that just through GitHub. I'll show you how to do that later if you're interested. And that just tells people like, hey, when you make an issue, can you fill in this basic information? That can be really, really useful. The other thing is I don't have one here. Ah, yes, I do. So if your account you're working with has a contributing guide, it'll show up here under helpful resources. This is super useful. So if you're making your own code, if you can make a contributing guide, it tells people how they can contribute to your project. So what's the normal workflow? What are you looking for? If you're contributing to someone else's, it's really useful to read them. If you're making your own code, it's really useful to have one. Um, but that's, so I know this one, but if you, see one, please read it. They're super, super useful. Okay, so this looks good. I like the changes. I can see them again right here. I'm just gonna click create pull request. And now what I can see is back on the one I originally forked from. So not on my CU Open Sci one, but on the EMD Pre one, I see I have a pull request. Um, and then I, as the person who's receiving it, can go and see what kind of changes I could pull into my code. And this one looks pretty good, so I'm just gonna go ahead and do it. So I can click Merge Pull Request. They aren't always this easy. Sometimes you may wanna have back and forth, and this is where this GitHub is super useful because you can have the conversation right there about the pull request and about what changes. You can also review it. So I can approve it or request changes, and I can actually go through and work with people right in GitHub about the changes that I'm making on the code. Let's just merge it. And so it says where it's from. And that's great. So you've done a pull request. OK. So that was the main stuff I wanted to cover. And I think, what time are we at? Three, four. Great. OK. So we have a little bit more time. So. What questions do people have about pull requests? And then we're gonna try doing exactly the same thing, but from another branch. Okay. If questions come up, just shout them out. Awesome. All right, so let's go back to lesson five, collaborating with a remote repository. Nice, okay. So now what we would like to do is we're gonna go ahead and work, uh, here we go. We're gonna work with those two copies that we made earlier. So we made papers and we made local papers. Do folks still have those? Awesome, okay. So just as a reminder, all that we did was we get cloned two different times, the same repository. But because they're two different clones, we can treat them as separate. So what we'd like to do is in one of them, so I'm gonna go back into papers, I'm gonna do, um, I'm gonna edit my journal file, and then I'm gonna add author affiliations. So who, I'm gonna, under me and my friends, I'm gonna say who are all based in super cool places. Okay, so I'm gonna save that change. Nice, all right, now I'm gonna get add. Um, journal. If I could spell, git commit, added author affiliations, said all of the cool places my friends live. Okay, 
So now that we've committed this, we can just git push. And if we go back, so for me, I was on git course. Now I'm going to go to papers on GitHub. I can see that this commit pushed. So on your papers repository on GitHub, you should see this as well. And if you don't, please just put up a sticky. Okay. So this is great. Looks good. So now I'm going to go to my other copy, which is in my case called laptop papers. So if I change the directory with CD into laptop papers, I'm going to go ahead and not git pull. This is crucial. I'm just going to go ahead and work on the file. So if I do nano journal, I'm going to say, OK, me and my friends. And then I'm going to say, um, we live in cool houses in cool places. So you'll notice before I had typed this line in, but because now I'm on a different clone, so I get clone twice, this is the other clone. Now that line that I had typed previously isn't there and I can instead type this line. So this will often, often happen if you're working on different computers and you forget to git pull, right? Or you're working with collaborators who maybe pushed a change and you didn't know about it, you didn't check GitHub, and so you've been working on it yourself. Basically, we've done twice the work, um, but we did it in slightly different ways. So what are we going to do about that? So basically what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and save this. We're going to see that a problem is coming. We're going to charge forward anyway. Um, so we're going to go ahead and save this. And then what we're going to do is just what we did before. We're going to add journal, git add journal, git commit, added author affiliations, discussed the cool houses houses all of my friends live in. Okay, so we're going to save this. Cool. So the situation is now we have a clone called papers and a clone called laptop papers. They're the same code. We just gave them two different names. We've made commits in each of them with the same commit title, but the actual content was slightly different. We could also have different commit titles, but just to kind of show that we were doing the same thing. Now, what if I try and push it? Dun, 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 dun. Okay, some people may have seen this already, if there was a readme up there. And it's going to say rejected, which feels very harsh, but Git is trying to help us. Um, so it's going to say rejected, fetch first, error, we couldn't push, updates were rejected because the remote contains work that you do not have locally. See, Git is really trying to help us out here. This is actually really nice. Um, this is usually caused by another repository pushing to the same reference. You may want to integrate the remote changes, e.g. Git pull before pushing again. See the note about fast forwards. Thank you, GitHub. Despite like the rejection, I feel pretty good about this because we know what GitHub wants us to do. It wants us to pull in the changes that we don't have. Okay, so what can we do? Let's try it. Git pull. And it says, looking good, looking good, looking good. Nope, there's a conflict. So let me pull this a little higher up so everyone can see it. Merge conflict. Automatic merge failed, fix conflicts, and then commit the result. So this is very frustrating. I felt like the first couple times I saw this, I was like, well, I'm just going to delete my local copy, done with that. Um, but you don't need to feel that way. It's totally workable. So basically what we want to do is Git is trying to help us. It wants us to go look at what we've done in the two different places, and we just need to tell it which one we like. 
So let's go do it. So it says fix conflicts and then commit the result. Okay, so if we do git status, we can see that it's actually telling us this is the file that's the problem. This journal.md is what it's calling both modified. So you've modified it locally and you've also modified it remotely and I don't know which one I'm supposed to work with. So what am I supposed to do? Please help me. So, all right, let's go try and help it. So if you pull up journal MD in your favorite text editor, you can see that Git's really trying to help here. So what it does is it takes the two lines that we committed. So if you remember the one we pushed is who are all based in super cool places. And the one we have locally is we live in cool houses in cool places. There was a lot happening here. Um, but basically it's telling us these are the two options. And you can tell which one belongs to which because here it puts a bunch of little arrows and what it's calling head, which it means is the most recent copy you have locally. It's the, the head of the master branch, so like the top of the branch. Um, then it has this little dividing line, which is just a bunch of equal signs, and it's just supposed to mean this is the other copy, this is my dividing. And then it says that the option where I did who are all based in super cool places, it tells me that belongs to this crazy long commit. Right? So Git is just asking me, which one do you want? Do you want the one that you have locally or do you want the one that you have remotely? And I'm gonna say, um, I don't have a strong preference. I'm gonna have the one that we have remotely. So let's say that I've changed my mind, I want the run one remotely, I don't want the one that I did locally. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take where Git did that dividing line and I'm gonna delete everything that belonged to head. The other thing which often happens when I'm working very quickly and is always confusing, my collaborators are always like, what did you do here? Um, you need to de delete this line. If you don't delete it, it'll show up on GitHub and on your changes. Um, so if you delete this line as well, then I'm telling GitHub or get this is the copy that I want. So if I do control X, which for me is exiting nano and saving it, um, but for you, whatever you need to do to save and exit this file. Now I can do git status and it'll still tell me both modified, but now I know because I've just made the changes, I know that this is the version that I want. So I do git add journal, and then I can do git commit, and it'll tell me, so it knows that this is what it calls a merge commit, because I'm merging in these two different changes. So it showed me option A, and it showed me option B, and I said I would like option A. You could also, if you wanted, create some commit that was the mixture of the two. So I could do whatever I wanted here to make it so that they were all merged together. Choose A or B, make something in between A or B, delete that line entirely. Whatever you want to do, you could do here to merge them. And so then by default, because it knew that I had this problem, it's going to tell me you're creating a merge commit is what it's called when you've merged these two together. And so it'll say, I'm just going to go ahead and, and call it this. It'll tell you the file that was conflicting. And then you can say, yep, that sounds great. You could also rename this if you wanted. It wouldn't mess with it. And so now I can do git push again. And it'll go somewhat slowly because of my internet. But then if I look here, now I see that I have this merge commit on GitHub and it's no problem. So we were able to keep both copies. We didn't have to delete and reclone anything. We could just fix the problem that GitHub identified, make the changes that we want, and then we're back right into our normal workflow of making changes, git add, git commit, git push. And really all this taught us is that when you start working, it's really, really helpful if you can do a git pull. Just when you sit down to start working on something, if you 
do a git pull first, then you'll get the most recent changes, and then you can go ahead and start adding your own stuff. But even if you forget and you get a merge conflict, it's not a big deal. It's totally solvable. Um, it is a little annoying the first couple times. You're like, oh, I forgot again. But it's really not a big deal. It's something very easy to work through. Yes? So if you pull the changes, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the question is, if I've pulled something, but it's actually the wrong version and I want my local copy, can I go back to the copy I had before, before I did the pull? No, so that's a great question. So basically what you could do is if this gets into rewriting history, which we don't have covered here, but is, is a really good question. Elizabeth, yeah. Before, before you go to that, it depends. Yeah. Can I just ask a quick question? It depends if you or have newer changes of the same repo locally, or if the newer changes are also reflected on, on, on GitHub. Which, which one is the newest one? The one on your local machine. So if the one on your local machine is the newest one, yeah, I think you'll be fine because Git will say, oh, I mean, I'm going to try to pull things, but I've got already already everything that is on GitHub or yeah. have it locally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I don't, I don't have, to I have to pull anything. Everything's there already. Yeah. And, and that's because Git is adding little nodes, you know, to yeah. like, uh, you know, so you're, yeah. So even though there's a merge conflict in terms of or a conflict, even though they're not the same file, yeah. when you pull, you're not going to lose any information. Yeah, so, so sorry, just to, to kind of repeat what JB said for everyone. So basically the, um, the idea here is if you pull and your changes locally are the latest, so everything on GitHub was already there and now you've made things on top of it, it will just keep the things that you've made. But if you have you know, additional changes on GitHub, say from another computer or from a colleague, and you pull those and then you don't want them anymore, you want to go back to your old version, you can do kind of like a, the easiest way to do it would be what I showed you earlier with the git checkout and the commit name. So you could go check out that previous commit and then basically you'd, you'd start a new branch um, from that commit where you'd be like, okay, I want this version. I want to move forward with that. Yeah, great question. What other questions do people have? Does this just feel like totally overwhelming right now? That's totally okay. All it is is it just takes a little bit of practice. Um, okay, so maybe what we can do is let's go ahead and try the pull request process one more time. So how about this? On, can everyone fork this repository. And yes, this my copy. So even if you have not been following along to this point, if you can jump on your computer and follow along to this point, let's do it all together. Okay, so what we're gonna do is you go to github.com slash emdupree slash papers. And you're gonna click fork. And actually, very helpfully, if you hover over it on GitHub, it says fork your own copy of EM Dupree papers to your account. Okay. So for me, I'm gonna fork it to poor CU OpenSci. I'm gonna fork it to CU OpenSci again. And it should say forking EM Dupree, Dupree papers for you. If it doesn't say that, Please put up a yellow sticky or just raise your hand. Okay, cool. Great. So you should have a fork. So here it should be github.com slash your username slash, um, does it say papers for you or does it have a different username? Perfect. Okay. Yes. So what's happening there is GitHub is like, okay. You already have a papers repository. If I make a fork of something with the same name, that's going to confuse everyone. So let me give it a slightly different name, which is good. So now for you, it's called papers one. 
with a hyphen, right? Yes, perfect. Okay, so what we're gonna do is let's go to our desktop or wherever you'd like to be. I like my desktop. And we're gonna just do the whole process. So we're gonna git clone. Remember this is gonna make a copy. And then we're gonna git clone our fork. So not emdu pre slash papers, but your username slash papers. <coughs> so for me, it's cu open sci. Okay. Okay. Goodbye, papers. All right. So git clone should give you cloning into papers. So for you, I'm sorry, it'll be papers one. And it'll say, let me just go ahead and call it papers one. Cloning into papers one, unpacking objects, done. Did anyone hit a bug there? If you did, just put up a yellow sticky. Cool, okay, so if you have papers one locally, let's go ahead and CD into papers one, and CD is change directory. And now that we're here, let's just see kind of what's going on. So let's do ls, we see these files that we had made before. Now let's do, let's remind ourselves what we've done, so let's do git log, and that's gonna show us all the changes that we made, so we dealt with that merge conflict, we added our author affiliations um, twice. So it has it twice because these are the two different versions that were merged together. So as you can see from the commit, so discuss the cool houses and set all of the cool places. They're two different commits. You can also tell that from the commit IDs being different. And they were merged together when we solved that conflict. And then we also have the other stuff we did about figures, results section, title and authors. So all of that is in this clone that we've created. And it's all on our local machine. So this is awesome. So let's say that this is my collaborator's paper and I would like to add a review because she wrote maybe not the most helpful results section I've ever read. Um, so let's say I wanna help her out and I wanna point out, you know, like maybe these are some of the details we should add. So I'm going to, in my cloned copy, do nano journal. And I'm going to say, these were, results were amazing. Some of the things they showed were, for example, that something. Okay, so I'm gonna save this. And again, whatever text editor you wanna work with, just go ahead and make a change. That's the really important thing. It doesn't have to be about the results section. You can critique literally any part of this paper. <laughs> There's like not a lot happening here. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and save this. So now on my machine, I can do cat, and I can see that these changes were made. Looks good. So now what I wanna do is I wanna do git add again the file that I made changes on. Because, if you've already done this, don't worry, I'm just gonna show you git status. It's just gonna tell me, I'm on my branch master, I haven't staged these changes for commit, journal.md. So, what we can do is we can do git add journal, we can do git commit, and I can say reviewed, results pointed out the lack of detail in results. Frowny face. Okay, so then I can save this commit message and now what I can do is I can git push. And when I git push, when I go look here, I should see that it's one commit ahead on my fork. So again, this is on your fork. So for me, it's CU open sci. For you, it'll probably be your username slash papers hyphen one. Um, 
I can click on journal.md and it'll say exactly the change I just made. Oops, that was not where I was supposed to go. Ah, that's what happens. Okay, cool. All right, so now I can tell that I've made a change that I want to be pulled into EMG Pre, that original one that I forked. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna click pull request. And again, this is requesting that EMG Pre pull in my code. So if I click pull request, it'll say, hey, just making sure you know what you changed. You know what you're proposing to be pulled in to EMG Pre's code. So I can say, this is what I want to pull in, and I can see the base is again EMG Pre papers, and I'm pulling from C Open Sci papers. In your case, it's EMG Pre papers pulling in from your repository slash papers one. Um, yeah. So if we now create a pull request, does it mean that you will receive a bunch of pull requests? Yes. To it's totally fine. Okay. <laughs> yes. But that's great. That's what we want. So it's Pull requests are great. So this is one of the things that when you contribute to other people's code, you kind of need to decide for yourselves. I'm of the idea to create pull requests early and often. So as soon as you have code that you've changed, even if it's not totally ready, if you just want feedback on it or you want to talk about it with the person, go ahead and start the pull request. And they may not accept it that day. They may not accept it in a month. But you can have that conversation and you can see what those changes are because having this little nice difference is really, really Really nice. Yeah. Um, and if you wait too long and there are like a 17 files changed and uh, like a hundred of lots of codes changed, but it's, it's going to be really hard and like a, a big job for someone to actually do that. If, it, if it's a little chunk that is yeah. the size on one little topic, you know, that's, that's going to be much easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's say we create the pull request. And here you could add in more detail. So it's really helpful when you're working with other people to read their contributing guide just to see the kind of detail that they want. And this is something as you write your own contributing guides will be really, really useful to think about. Um, so in my case, I'm going to say pointed out the lack of detail in the results. You can use emojis on GitHub. It's very useful. Um, so I'm going to say disappointed emoji. Um, this is just a fun, fun thing. OK, and then I'm going to say create pull request. So again, this is the, I'm asking for EMG pre slash papers to pull in the code from, in my case, CU open slash slash papers. In your case, your username slash papers one. So I'll create pull request. It'll think about it, think about it, think about it. Boom. We have 10 other pull requests. Way to go, guys. This is great. For some of you, this was maybe your first pull request, in which case Kirsty would advocate that we had a gong in the room. Mom. But, <laughs> but that's amazing. These are super useful. So this is something that's really, really great working with code online and with colleagues and collaborators, this allows you to work with basically anyone in the world. So you don't just have to be confined to working on code that you have right access to. Now that you understand pull requests, you can work with anyone. You can just go to a code base and be like, this is so great, but I found this one thing that I really think you should change. Please review my request that you pull my change in, and then we can all have better software all the time. So this is really, really cool. Come on, this is great. Now we're at 14. Awesome. OK. Yes? If I create a pull request, and let's say it takes them a really long time to accept it, but I still want to keep getting all of their changes. Yeah. Can I keep pulling their changes without dealing with a lot of conflicts, or will I have to deal with that every time? Great question. So the question is, if I have created a pull request, but it's not yet accepted, and I want to keep getting changes, can I keep pulling, or will that introduce conflicts every time? Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so I think the key here is where the changes are made. So if they change the exact same line that you changed, then GitHub will be like, 
uh, which one do you want? Um, but in a bigger code base, so more than just my very tiny embryo of a paper, um, you usually have a lot of lines, so that doesn't happen every time. So honestly, most of the time I work with other people, when I do a git pull, I just get like a, like a fast forward that we saw earlier when there were no problems, and it just pulls their changes in. Occasionally, I'll have merge conflicts, but not personally, not terribly often. It kind of depends on the code and who you're working with. But this is one of the reasons that having pull requests open early is really nice, too, because like as JB said, when you have more and more changes that you're making, if you don't have people aware that you're su going to suggest these changes, they're more likely to make their own changes, and then you can duplicate the work, and it makes it harder. Great question. What other questions do people have about this? Yes. So, I'm still struggling a little bit with the distinction between forced and cloning. Yeah. So if we had to cloning, cloning. The, the repository instead of fork, could we have worked on it anyway? Or like, what, yeah. so what's the big advantage of like, what yeah. we have to fork? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question, as I understand it, is really what's the difference between forking and cloning? What's the advantage to forking and then cloning versus just, say, cloning? Right. Yeah, this is a great question. So basically this gets down again to what you have right access to. So if I have my own GitHub repository, or like you saw, I had a long list of organizations. So if you and your friends, maybe your lab, has what's called a GitHub organization, like a team, and you have equal rights to everything under there. When you fork that, it's not really necessary. You could just clone it because you already have write access. So then when you made changes locally and push them, it would go back to the main repository, right? Because you have write access to it. So let's say I'm in my wonderful team and the repository is our super cool paper. Because I'm in my wonderful team, if I clone my super cool paper and make changes to it and push, they'll show up in my super cool paper because I'm part of the team. But if I wanted to make changes to another team, so let's say another team had come up with this amazing software and I wanted to help them with it, I couldn't, if I cloned the other cool team slash super cool software, and I made changes to it and then I went to push, it would yell at me that I'm not in my, the other cool team, I don't have write permissions there, so that it wouldn't get accepted. And you, and you cannot make a pull request if you didn't fork. Exactly. So, yeah, so you can later go add in a fork, but you do need the fork. Um, so, you need to have on GitHub gone and said, okay, this amazing software exists. I would like to propose that they pull in my changes, so I'll make a fork of it so then I have write access to it and then I can clone it. And when I make changes on the cloned copy, they'll show back up on the fork, so then I can make the pull request from there. Great question. I think it, in a sense, cloning and forking are almost the same thing. Uh, forking is cloning on GitHub. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're making uh, uh, your, on your place on GitHub, you're making the clone on that place on GitHub, and, and, and GitHub calls that forking, but that's, uh, Basically, it's right. Yes, it's, yeah, it, it gets. It's, and also, GitHub would keep track of where it comes from. So, if you could have one of the remotes of that fork, it's going yeah. to be the original repository. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and cloning would be doing the same thing, but on your local. Yeah. Uh, so it's. Literally, it's, it's, it's almost the same thing. It's but, just as, as Elizabeth was saying, it's what do you have right access to? Yeah. And, you know, and, and if you want to actually. Put some code to some place where you don't have write access. The only way to do that is to actually do a pull request. I mean, and doing a pull request from your local machine is not something that is uh, right. It's probably something possible. <laughs> not really. Not yeah. Data makes it very easy when you have a, a local copy or on GitHub on your place. So yeah. So so I would just say kind of my takeaway there is that uh, fork and clone are very related. When you fork something, that's something you do on GitHub. It's like a GitHub thing, so that now it exists a copy on GitHub that you can then clone and work with locally. And then you can push changes to that fork. But this is something that will come as you practice it. So you can clone any repository, and then you can 
try it and be like, oh wait, I don't have write access. Let me go add a fork on GitHub and then I'll add it locally and then I'll push it. Just to make sure Yeah. If you fork but not clone it, then does it mean you cannot work on it? So if you fork it and you don't clone it, what it means is I have a copy on GitHub. So let me show you an example. So I have so many repositories. Many of them are just forks of other people's repositories. Okay, so I have Data Lab. I forked Data Lab at some point. So this fork exists, but I don't have a local clone. So the only way I could interact with my copy, my fork of Data Lab, is through GitHub itself. If I wanted to make changes locally, I would need to clone it. And so what you can actually do is click here and it tells you the URL. Um, but it's the same as it is up here. So you just do git clone that, and then a copy will be locally. And actually, GitHub gives you some capacity to actually edit stuff on GitHub. So you, know, you could potentially do things like write on GitHub. It's not probably the yeah. easiest or anything, but could, uh, if you don't have to test some code or if you just have to update the readme uh, GitHub can show you the readme markdown, and you can actually edit that file on GitHub. Yeah. Without any local copy, and then do your pull request. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was there another question? Yeah. If you're merging uh, two versions that have conflicts, yeah. do you selectively keep bits of the code versions, or do you have to go with completely one version? No, great question. So the question is if you're, you've gotten a merge conflict, just like we did earlier with papers and laptop papers, where we had made a change and we hadn't pulled it in before we made our own change. Um, do I have to choose between the two changes? Can I make something in between? Great question. Um, so no, you don't have to choose between the two changes. You can make something in between. So what's happening is if we look back at uh, git log, you can see we got this, what's called a merge commit. And I'm calling it that because it starts with the word merge. It is what GitHub auto-populated our commit message with. And so because this is its own commit, Anything can be in there. So you could actually get rid of both of them and write an entirely new idea. You could take pieces from one or the other, or you could choose just one or the other. You can do whatever is necessary here to merge the two versions in your mind, but that doesn't necessarily mean choosing just one option. Great question. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, great question. So the question is, what happens if you accidentally upload a file that you don't want to be on your repository? Does it matter to you if it's in history? <laughs> yes. Never. No. It's maybe only happened to me like a hundred times. Yes. Um, yeah. 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 No. So sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is really common. So the reason I asked, does it matter to you if it's in history? Because if you don't care, if it's not sensitive data, or if it's not your 100th PDF that you've uploaded to GitHub, which does have a size limitation after a certain point, and you're like, maybe I should take some of these down. Um, so if it's not those two, if you delete it, commit the directory. So what I could do, let me just show you that really quickly, because I do think it's useful. So if I do ls, and I say, actually, I'm done with common. I don't like it anymore for whatever reason. And then I do git status. It'll say deleted. So I could do git add dot. And now if I do git status, it'll say it's deleted. And so if I git commit and push this, now common will be deleted. It will still be in my history. That's the difference. So if I don't want it in my history, what I have to do is change history. Um, and this is something that GitHub allows, Git and GitHub allow you to do. Um, so we didn't get to talk about it too, too much here. Um, there's this thing called rebasing, which is magic and wonderful and sometimes black magic. Um, and it allows you to edit a lot of commits all at once. So it allows you to change history. The one I do want to tell you about right now, because I think it's very, very useful and a little less black magic, is git revert. 
So basically what you can do is if you have a specific commit, so if you know that you added something and you just want to change all of those things all at once, you can do git revert and the commit ID. So if I do git log and then this commit ID, so I'm copying it, copying it, and then I can do git revert and the commit ID, it would create a new commit that would revert that commit. So this doesn't solve your history problem yet, but it's a, a way where you can create things that go through and actually undo the changes that you've made. The problem is now both of these are in history. So I will show you git rebase, and we can talk about it in office hours because it is really useful. So if I get do git rebase i, which means interactive, because it's always easier to change things when you can play around with them a little bit. And I do head, so we've seen head a couple of times, and again, that just means head of the master branch, so the top of the most recent thing. And I'm going to do tilde and commit number, like how many commits ago. So let's say I made this mistake four commits ago. So I'm going to do five. So five commits back. Uh, Don't worry about that. Okay. So now what I can see is I can see all of these commits, the last five commits. And it is trying to help me here. It says, here are some commands. You can either pick, which means to use that commit, reword, which means to edit it, or like edit specifically the message, sorry. Um, Edit proper, which means that you can use the commit, but will allow you to amend it a little bit. Um, squash, which is use the commit, but get rid of the commit message, basically. Uh, fix up, which is use the commit, but pretend the message didn't exist at all. Run the command using exec or drop. This is the crucial one, using D. So what drop will do is it will drop it from your history. So what we can do is not only revert the changes because we've gotten rid of this commit, we can also pretend that commit never existed in history. So this is really, really useful in the case you're saying like where you've committed things that you shouldn't commit that you don't want the world to know ever existed. Um, most of the time I find myself using like rebase, uh, not rebase, um, revert where I want to change specific things but it's okay that they're in history. But for rebase it's really like okay, I want to pretend that this never happened. So yes, it's definitely doable. It also just takes a little bit of practicing with, but as soon as you're here, you can go through and be like, I want to drop this. And if I were to save right now, then it would drop it from my history. Does anyone have any questions about that? It's kind of a weird thing. So, right, if you're thinking about you've just gotten started, you're just writing all this history, but we want to go through and actually uh, change history that we're writing, it can be a little bit weird. So, it just it's one of those things where as you get used to it, you'll probably have a chance when you need rebase. So, know that it is possible, but in the beginning, um, it's just it's easy to think about just the workflow of add, commit, push, pull, fork, and clone. And then worry about changing history when you need to. That's where dangitgit.com is really useful. Dang it, git. It's like, oh shit, git, but without the swearing. Um, okay. And so I can actually see, so this is the other fun thing about rebasing. Sometimes you'll do things you don't intend. So I added a merge conflict. Maybe this is fine because it gives us a chance to go look at merge conflicts again. So if I do git status, woof. Um, so I can do, actually I'm gonna do git rebase abort, which it tells me to do right now if I wanna check out the original branch. Git status, and now I'm okay. That's the other thing about rebase is it can be kind of weird because it's more likely to have some side effects. So this is where just reading Git's help text is super great. It comes up a lot with a lot of help text and it's kind of intimidating to read when it's all red, but it's fine. It's trying to help you out and it really wants to give you the options that are most likely 
to get you out of whatever mess you're in or get you wherever your code needs to be. Okay, so now what we've done is really cool. So in the past little bit, we've created a repository with git init. We've added files to it. Um, we've made changes to those files. We use git add to tell git to track them. We use git commit to record down what we track. So again, in this idea of version control as a conversation, we're able to say, hey, git, I'm this person. This is what I've done in like human readable language. So I can always come back or my colleagues can come back and see exactly what happened. And then once we did add commit, we were able to actually push it to GitHub because we set up pushing and we set up this remote repository in this lesson on uh, collaborating with GitHub. Yeah, getting started with GitHub. And then we were able to push it to there. We were able to pull down changes to a different local copy. We were able to fork repositories that we don't have right access to, clone them locally, and then do the exact same workflow there so that we can then do a pull request on the original repository. So that's a lot which means that it's totally normal right now to feel like that was way too much. Um, the good thing is this is all stuff that you'll use all the time in the hackathon. And you're surrounded by lots of people who are also very motivated to use exactly these things and quite a few experts actually. Um, so just practice. Just, you know, when you get a chance, whenever you find your hackathon partner, if you want to come do it with me in office hours, I'd love to. Just like make some more pull requests, make some more changes. As you do this, it just gets easier and easier. But again, it's a conversation with a little bit of jargon in the beginning. So it's confusing to learn all the terms. But as you do, it just becomes more and more natural. Okay. Are there any final questions before we break? Now, all right, thanks everyone.